Hey, happy Sunday, everybody. How are you guys doing? Good stuff. Awesome. I love the energy. And let me tell you, we have a jam-packed day today because not only are we in the fourth week of our series, The Family, but we're also celebrating baptisms. And everybody who's getting baptized in this service is right over there. So can we give them a huge hand? Awesome. Fantastic. And so I am grateful that you all are here in this room. For those of you who are joining us via stream, wherever you are, welcome. But before we get to our baptisms, I also wanted to um, focus your eyes on something that's going to be happening in just a few short weeks. And it's called Discovering Kensington. And it's really for anybody who is relatively newer to our community, who wants to take the first step or the next step and to learn more about who we are. And so we're actually going to be having two events. And the in-person event is going to be happening two weeks from today on May 16th. And then the virtual event is going to be on the evening of May 19th. And so if you would like more information, if you would like to sign up. All you have to do is go to our website or our app, or if for those of us who are here in person, you can just go out to the lobby and you can just talk to people at the hub and you'll see them out there because they have bright orange shirts on. And so as I mentioned, we're, ba we're celebrating baptisms today. And one of the things that we communicate and declare when we are baptized is the fact that Jesus has transformed our lives. And so we wanted to sing a song together that really speaks powerfully to the ability of Jesus to change us and the beauty of his forgiveness. And so if you are able to, I'd love for you to join us and stand, uh, stand and join us. And let's sing this out together.
that's the way to open up, yes? Would you give them another hand, Lachelle? Thank you so much, and the team. Welcome, you can, you can have a seat. Uh, boy, I don't remember a time that we've actually opened a service quite like this. In fact, all the years I've been here, I don't know if we've done baptisms right out of the chute. But I'll tell you something, last service, it was so powerful. Because that song speaks so clearly to what we're going to witness. Now we know something in this moment, there's nothing holy in this water, other than me. No, I'm just kidding, but there's nothing holy, there's nothing magical about this water. But in baptism, I like how you laugh so hard, thank you. Uh, but, but what is going to happen in these moments, our people are going to declare their allegiance, their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ. And when they go under the water, it said that they're gonna wash away all the things of this world, the old part of their life. And when they come up, God is gonna redeem everything that they had and point them in a new direction. It's a new future. And so in those moments, what I'm asking you to do is celebrate. Like really yell out and celebrate because these moments are powerful moments. And here's what I wanna say. This is, this is our group. In fact, for everyone that's getting baptized, can you just stand up and let us see you real quick before we get into this? Um, hey, just stay, stay, stay standing. Stay standing for a minute, because I want to talk to you. We're going to talk in the tub as well. But I just want to say to you something. This moment is a powerful moment for your life. This is a life-changing moment. And sometimes in our culture, they won't realize how powerful this moment actually is. But I can testify to the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in you that when you come out of the water, your life is going to be moving in another direction that God is going to clean you in a new way and he's gonna give you a vision and he's gonna take your heart and your heart is actually gonna be activated to know that you are a son or a daughter of the highest king and that highest king is gonna point you to a new future. And here's what I want you to know, it's not just for you. Here's the powerful part about this moment. It's a personal moment and then it's a communal moment for the world because he will send you out to bring his kingdom. So I'm proud of you. I'm excited to be in this moment with you. It's humbling. And so I'm just grateful for you. So give them one more big hand. So you can have a seat. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, the, the band is going to lead us in a song. It's going to set the tone. Beautiful, beautiful song that I love so much. We're going to sing a verse in a chorus. And then we're going to hear a testimony of somebody. And then we're going to baptize. And then we might do that again and hear another testimony. And then we're just going to baptize right in a row. So take this in and celebrate what's happening in this beautiful life change rooted in the person of Jesus. After being raised in a traditional church, I fell away from faith in my teens, and I started using alcohol and drugs. I felt angry, defeated, overweight, ashamed, and I'd lost my joy for life. Years later, when I was asked to reflect on what was missing in my life by a supervisor, spirituality was at the top of my list, and he encouraged me to attend three services in three different kinds of churches in one month including Kensington. A coworker also advised me, if you work on this one, 
my spirituality, everything else will get better. My first service at Kensington was Christmas Eve with my daughter when Danny Cox spoke. I was overwhelmed with emotions and tears filled my eyes. We love the service. We began to attend regularly and God's word became seed planted in my heart. The first time I turned to God for help, he showed up. I had a family member who was homeless and missing and I prayed that God would help me find her and guide her to healing. And when I finally found her and we picked up her belongings under a bridge, God gave me all the words to say to convince her to get the help she needs. Four years later, she's in treatment, she's alive, and she's a joy to be around. I realized that God has always been there, ready to help. Now I avoid negative influences like drugs and alcohol, smoking, and even social media. My life has been transformed, and I'm now present with the ones I love and with my team at work. I've lost weight, I'm healthy, I'm active, I'm experiencing joy, and I'm living my life. It's a miracle. And I'm getting baptized today because God saved my life by leading me to him and sharing my to testimony is to help others. Wow, wow. Um, here's, what, here's what I was thinking. Uh, when I was listening to you. And, so, and, and this is what I see in you as you spoke. The idea that you would be called home, you know, you, you felt something Christmas, that was God moving. I had nothing to do with us or me. That's God in your life moving and calling you home. And to me, it's interesting then your eyes go to a homeless person that you love and that you pursue. That is the tangible part of our faith, that you would have the heart for ones that are not home that you'd have the hearts that are for the ones that are hurting and God is gonna send you. And so I wanna encourage you, as you go through this moment, God is going to make you someone that pursues people that don't have home and help them find their way home. So that's what I hear from you. Here, give me a hand. Amanda, have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. Make him your Lord and Savior? Yes. Love him with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength? Yes. We, and we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Here it's because I have allergies, so it's okay. I've been a believer in Jesus Christ as my Savior my entire life, but like many, I've struggled on and off with addictions, which has caused me to not be honest to those closest to me and most importantly to God. My issues didn't happen overnight, but they grew over many, many years 
to where I finally found myself trapped in a strong feeling of hopelessness. My, no matter how hard I tried, I was unable to break that deceptive lifestyle I knew was wrong. Unfortunately, maybe fortunately, it took a life-changing event for me about a year and a half ago that brought everything to a halt. And I blame my mom because she uh, typically prays for me when that happens, things can get really dicey. Uh, so what was going on in the dark was exposed by the light. And through God's grace and a very loving wife, two kids and parents on both sides, I've asked God for forgiveness and them, repented, was able to be honest about everything which was very difficult to do but was also necessary to finally be free. What I believe is nothing short of a miracle is that when I finally let him, Jesus, broke those chains that had complete control over me, and I literally, since that day, have had zero desire to go back to the things that consumed me for so many years. Last week's message is what really inspired me to publicly take this step of baptism and let go and let God guide me on how to continue to grow in my Christian walk, how to be a better husband, dad, and son. And I also look forward to seeing how God may use my life experience to help others. And I also believe that there may be somebody sitting here today or watching online that can relate to exactly what I'm talking about. And if, if you're that person, I know how it feels. And I strongly encourage you to reach out for help and bring light to darkness. God's waiting for you and I know from experience he doesn't want you to stay there. And I sincerely hope my story can encourage some of you to make that step as well. And I thank you for the opportunity. to meet just before this, yes. um, what I heard there when you were speaking that, the scripture says that the one that the son has set, set free is free indeed. And what I also heard was that faith is a journey, you know, and that God is continually making us clean. So this is your moment of freedom, like real freedom to move in a new way as a father, as a follower of Jesus, as a husband, as a leader. So Greg, if you decided on this day to follow Jesus, Yes. Make him your Lord and Savior. Yes. To love him with all your heart, mind, and strength. Absolutely. And we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Last service, 11 years old, too. Did you want to say anything? Okay, I, I, there is something that I like to say to young women, especially your age, and I said it to the, to, to the young girl, uh, Madeline, last service, too. Do you know your true identity? That you are a daughter of the highest king. That is power. That's powerful. That you always hold on to that. From this moment forward, never forget that. Because the world will try to tell you a lot of other things. But you are a powerful daughter of the highest king. You are a world changer at 11 years old. And so when you go into the water, you're going to come up a different person rooted in that confidence. And I hope that confidence never, never falters found in Jesus. So to you, I promise to follow Jesus and make him your savior all the days of your life. Yes. To love him with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Yes. And we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
I know, I know you were nervous. <laughs> you told me that. You're a big guy, man. You're bigger than me. What is going on right now? <laughs> hey, um, I just want to tell you, I'm proud of you. And I would say the same to you as I would say uh, to our daughters in this community. You are son of the highest king. And that, you, you have to hold on to that from this moment forward. Don't let that identity ever slip. Hold on to it. Be confident in it. You're a powerful warrior for the kingdom of God. So are you ready? Yes. All right. Have you decided to follow Jesus and make him your Lord and Savior? Yes. To love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Yes. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, you me, guys. That right there was a big splash. to follow Jesus all the days of your life, yes. to be a light, to be salt in this world, rooted in Jesus Christ, yes. to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Allison, how old are you? 13. 13. Look at this. 11, 13. Are you kidding me? You heard what I said before, but I want to cement that in your heart too. You are a warrior, powerful daughter of the highest king. Please hold on to that. Everything in this world tends to say that that's not who we are. So hold on to that from this moment. But Allison Riley, have you decided to follow Jesus all the days of your life? Um, to love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Make him your Lord and Savior. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> wow. Oakley, you're getting baptized too? Yeah. Wow. How old are you? You're five? Wow, you're certain boy. I'm going to tell you what. You come out of here, you're gonna change the world, son. All right, Allison and Oakley. You just want to. Oh, just a little bit? All right, well, I'll do you first then. Oakley. Have you decided to follow Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to make him the savior of your life? Follow him all your days. Let me baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right, Mama. I thought I was—I thought I was going to dunk you and your daughter together. Here, give me your hand here. Do you have something you want to say? I don't. How did you find yourself here? Through the strength of my family and my kids, and and being here and celebrating with them as much as we can, we just felt our home here, and we're just so excited. Awesome. Well, Allison, have you decided to follow Jesus to make Him the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Love with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength all of your days. Yes. We baptize the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
guys going to go together? Yes. How old are you? I'm nine. And I'm seven. Seven and nine? Oh, I know you're nine. Oh, right. oh, wait a minute. You're not seven. You're eight. <laughs> Thank you. Here, listen, give me a hand. You guys can hold hands together. I'll tell you what, today we're baptizing a lot of young women. A lot of young women are going to change the world. You guys are power world changers. Isabel, Eloise, we decided to follow Jesus all the days of your life to make him your Lord and Savior. To love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength all your days. Yes. And we baptize your name in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes. There's my boy. Wow. You ready? You. You. Oh, this little guy is special to me. Man, what a privilege it is to baptize you, little man. I saw this little guy when he was born. And then to see him now in this moment. Uh, yeah, you can plug your nose, man. <laughs> Beckham, you need to hear this from me, boy. I've, I've watched you since you've grown up. You got a beautiful mama. You got great family, great grandparents rooted in the person of Jesus. Son, you are a powerful, powerful warrior for Jesus. And I'm praying that your life is spent making him known to the world. All right? Now, you decide to follow Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to make him your Lord and Savior. Yeah? <laughs> We're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Way to go. Way to go. Awesome.
It's such a great and perfect song for this moment because ultimately what we just saw here points to the greatness of God because only he is able to bring about this change and this transformation in people's lives. And as Danny mentioned earlier, every single time I see a baptism, I'm also reminded it's not just, it doesn't just stay with that person, but the impact of that transformation goes out and it impacts future generations as well. And so it's such an amazing thing. One of the best things that we get to do in this community. And so would you, can, would you join me in prayer? And let's just spend a few moments just saying thank you to the Lord. So God, we thank you, Lord, for every single person, God, who was baptized today, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the work that you have done in their lives and the work that you are doing in their lives. And God, how you are going to use them, Lord, to impact Lord, the people around them, whether it be their family, their friends, their neighbors, God, their coworkers, whoever it may be, God. And thank you, Lord, for the fact that we have the privilege to be a part of it, to be able to witness it, God. And so we thank you, Lord, for your care, for your love, for your people, God, Lord. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Good stuff. And let me also say that whenever I see baptisms, one of the things that I am always reminded by is that when people say yes to following Jesus, that they enter into, that we enter into a brand new family, that we are now sons and daughters of the Most High King. And when it comes to the family of God, one of the things that God tells us in the scriptures as a family is that he tells us is that when one part of the family is hurting, that we aren't just supposed to just stand back, but rather we are supposed to engage and to move forward and to help in whatever way is needed. And right now, a part of our family is hurting. And if you've seen the news, if you received the email that we sent out earlier, you understand what is happening in India and the COVID crisis that is happening there. And it really is a full-blown humanitarian crisis. And our history with India is about 20 years in that they were our very first global partner. And our global partner over there, his name is Jaya Sankar, and he is a powerful leader. And so they actually sent us a video just helping us to better understand the situation and their needs and what is actually happening and uh, how they are working to really be able to help in what is occurring there. And so let's take a look at this video together. Hi, I am Prashant. I am Jaya's son. We are Kensington's first global partner and have been for over 20 years now. I'm a medical doctor and I work in this hospital here at Christ Evangelical Mission. This hospital was built by Kensington during the transformation campaign in 2011. Medical care is always a very high need here in our city of millions of people. The government of our state just asked us to open our hospital to the most critically ill COVID patients and I wanted to give my brothers and sisters at Kensington an update. You may have heard about the Indian COVID crisis that our country is facing. It's very urgent and it's very daring situation here. People are dying in our cities. We are very short on supplies and desperately need more very quickly. We are doing all we can to save lives here in this hospital and are thankful we have this space to share the love of Christ while providing urgent medical treatment. At this moment, we are able to house 50 COVID patients, which is not many, but it is the more than most hospitals are able to provide. Our medical system is at its maximum. People are waiting outside for more beds to open up. Our main priority is to get all the medical supplies necessary for treatment, including ventilators, beds, and most importantly, oxygen concentrators, which are very hard to get right now. Thank you again for your prayers and support as we are all trying to live through this pandemic right now in a very tense situation here in India. On behalf of all the doctors and nurses working with me at CEM, we thank you for loving others just as Christ does. Thank you all. God bless you. And so as you can see, the need is immense. 
And, but one of the things is that this hospital, it's called Christ Evangelical Mission, and it was built because of your generosity back in 2011 as part of the transformation campaign. And this, this hospital is being used, and it was recently just approved by the local government in their area to begin COVID-19 treatment. But yet there are so many people who still need help. And so Jaya Sankar and his team, they actually reached out to us recently, and they said, can you help us? And we need $51,000 to buy medicine as well as medical equipment. And so earlier last week, this past week, we actually sent an email out to our community asking, would anybody be interested? Could anybody step forward and actually contribute to this? And in a matter of days, $51,000 was raised. And so it's on its way. So we want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity because that is what I have seen in this community over and over and over again in that when there is a need, you have stepped forward. But as you can imagine, as I mentioned, the need is immense. It's a full-blown humanitarian crisis. And so in addition to the money that has already been sent over, we also wanted to continue to ask if anyone would be interested, if anyone could step forward to give to be able to purchase more medical equipment, more medicine, and also to be able to help assist a lot of the medical personnel as well as their families so they can actually begin to treat more and more people. And as I was thinking about this, for us as a community, this is not a have to, but really I look at this as a get to, in that we have the privilege of really being able to step in, of stepping in and to be able to help our brothers and sisters halfway around the world. And this is who we are as a community, as Kensington, is that when we see a need, we step forward and we say yes, whether it's locally, whether it's nationally, or whether it's globally. And so if you would like to contribute, how you can do so will be coming up on the screen. And so you can go to the website, kensingtonchurch.org forward slash India COVID relief. You can also go to our app as well, or you can text the words Kensington special by, uh, with the number seven, uh, by dialing the number 77977 and you can follow the prompts as well. And so if you are somebody who feels the nudge to give, we want to say thank you. Thank you so much. And I know Jaya Sankar and all of our global, and our global partners over in India, they are very, very grateful. And so today, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the service, we are also in the fourth week of our series, The Family. And so a lot is happening today in addition to that. And this series has really spoken powerfully to me because over the past first three weeks, we've talked about fathers, We've talked about children, and we have talked about parents, and today we are going to be talking about siblings and the sibling relationship. And the sibling relationship can be a difficult one. And looking back, and I'm somebody who grew up in church, but in the 40-some-odd years that I have actually been a part of the church, that I have never, ever heard a message on the sibling relationship. But yet, this is a relationship that has the potential to bring so much joy and beauty, and we saw an example of it in the tub in that these two sisters are being baptized together. But at the same time, as probably all of us know, that this relationship also has the potential to bring a lot of pain and anger and resentment into our lives as well. And so we're going to be talking about what it looks like in God's heart towards siblings. But before we actually get to that, to really be able to set up the day, we wanted to hear from some siblings in our community. And who better than to ask children because they are definitely honest. And so we actually did, interviewed a couple of siblings, and so a handful of siblings, and this is what they had to say about each other. So let's take a look together. Why would you say she's the most special sister in the entire world? Because she's my sister. Why would you say he's the most special brother in the entire world? Because... He's my brother, and I really like him. Pick one word that would describe each other. Sutton, playful, for sure. Mm -hmm. Emerson is, (laughs) I don't know. Fierce. Fierce? (laughs) He's really fun, and he doesn't like to give up. Which I like. She likes sports. Sometimes do you get in arguments? Yeah. Like um, about our cages. Here's what we were what we were going to play. Um, I would say for them it's cleaning the room. Every time oh, they have to clean the room, they can't clean fight the room together without <laughs> fighting. Once we um, fought over who played Bat- Lego Batman in a, a in a video game. <laughs> what kind of fights do you win? Um, if we were like wrestling, I would usually win that. What is your favorite things to do together if you guys like? Like, we talk while we get ready sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, while we're getting ready. 
if we all get ready together, like for like something like big, like getting ready together, or if we sometimes we all just like hang out in each other's room. And I like to dance, but Madison doesn't. And when she has to dance, she's like forced to, and she gets. <laughs> no, I just make up my own dance, like right there. I'm usually like ah. I'm usually like who's like, cute. Do you guys tell each other's secrets? No, no I don't oh. trust him with it. <laughs> Who gets in trouble more at home? I'm not really sure. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> what do you love about having siblings? Someone to talk to all the time. Yeah. If you yeah. have problems, there's always there to help yeah. you and, and to support like, you. Yeah. And like when I, hmm, not like play with, but like hang out with. Yeah. Yeah. Because. I'm starting to like them a little bit more <laughs> as we're all getting older. <laughs> but she's nice and funny, and it's also been fun to play with her during the pandemic because otherwise it would have just been boring like the whole time. Like if you're just doing nothing, there's nothing to do, and you don't have a sibling, there's like, it's just like, you can't play with your parents. They're probably working or something. Would you guys say that you're best friends? Uh, maybe. Yes. Just spending time together, just like, it's like when you get older, there's so many more things you can do with each of them. Harper, what do you love the most about Matheson? That she's nice and she keeps me company. Oh, that's so sweet. Man, I love those two because at that age, I definitely wouldn't have been hugging my sister. And so probably doing some other things to my sister, but definitely not that. And actually, two of those kids um, in that video, Eliana and Isaiah, are mine. And when we actually filmed this video two weeks ago in the basement, I was, on, I was standing in the background and I was a little bit shocked and wondering who these kids are because I have never heard these nice compliments come out of their mouths. And so they held it together for probably about 10 or 15 minutes and then we left and then they proceeded to fight for the next hour straight. And I was like, ah, there it is, right? That's more like the kids that I have. But this is so often, this is what it's like with our siblings in that we love them and we can't stand them all at the same time. And I was having a conversation with somebody in between the services and he was telling me about how when he was growing up, some of his siblings, they would, they would hit, hit themselves, hit each other with chairs over the head. And one of his sisters actually still has a scar from that. And so probably some of you have experienced it, hopefully not too many of you. But this is the thing with our siblings, is that unlike our friends, we can't choose our siblings. But so many studies have shown that our siblings, when it comes to our development, can have a greater impact on our life than even our parents. And for some of us, we might be best friends with our brother or our sister. And for others of us, that sibling relationship may be a source of pain and anger and deep disappointment. And if your experience is the latter, let me say that you are not alone because there are so many of us who have this type of relationship with our brother or our sister. And I have one sister and I am 15 months younger than her, but growing up, she treated me like I was 15 years younger. And I felt like I was constantly in her shadow growing up because everything she touched, it seemed like it turned to gold because she was a great pianist, she was a great artist, she was a great cook, and let me tell you, she is so ridiculously, ridiculously intelligent. And she tested into one of the best high schools in all of Vancouver. She went to the best engineering university in Canada, and then she turned down MIT because she wanted to do her master's and her PhD at Berkeley. And she didn't pay a dime for her entire post-secondary education because these schools, exactly, all right, right? Imagine being me though, right? It's like, I'm the little brother, right? Exactly, all right for her, but it stinks to be me, right? And so this is the sister that I had. And honestly, right, growing up, like she would get straight A's after straight A's all the time. And I would think to myself, hey, can you just throw me a bone by getting a B? Like I'll even take an A minus, right? Did anybody have this type of sibling? Anybody can relate. No, so you guys are all better than your siblings. Good stuff. Okay, so I am talking to the haves today. That's good to know. So I was the have not in this relationship. And growing up in school, I didn't even have a name, I felt like, because everyone just saw me as Amy's little brother. And I felt so small and insignificant, and I constantly felt like I was bringing up the rear. And so this was my experience growing up, and it wasn't so much fun. And I was jealous of her because, honestly, who wouldn't be? And I resented her not only for bossing me around and treating me like I was a kid, but also crushing me in everything. And in most sibling relationships, there is an undercurrent of friendship and competition, of tension 
and joy, but at the same time also sometimes torment as well. And that's because most sibling relationships are a mixed bag. And when we look at the scriptures, what we see is that they are full of stories of dysfunctional family relationships, including dysfunctional sibling relationships. And in the very first book, the book of Genesis, what we actually see is that we see relationships that were so incredibly messed up. And we see examples of siblings who griped and grappled, who wrestled and whined, who competed and resented each other, even to the point where one sibling got sold off into slavery and one even killed the other because it's all fun and games until something like that happens. And so today we wanted to look at one of those sibling relationships in the book of Genesis. And as I mentioned, this one, there's a lot of ups and downs with this story, but ultimately what this communicates to us is that there is hope is that no matter how broken, no matter how difficult our relationship with that brother or that sister may be, this story tells us that with the help of God, that we can move towards healing, towards reconciliation and wholeness in this area of our life. And if you've ever heard of the name Abraham in the Old Testament, he was the one who God gave all of these amazing promises to. Promises that included that all, everyone on this earth would be blessed through him and that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. But as you can imagine, for Abraham and his wife Sarah, at times this latter promise especially was difficult for them to believe because they struggled with infertility for so long. But as God always does, he came through. And, and what happened was that Sarah gave birth to a son named Isaac. And Isaac married a woman named Rebecca, but they too, they struggled with infertility. But eventually, Rebecca became pregnant and she gave birth to twin boys. But from the very beginning, these two, there was conflict and there was tension between them. And this is actually what it says in the book of Genesis. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? She asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger one. And so from the very beginning, these two parents, they understood that their sons, that they, there, there would be a rivalry. And ultimately what would happen is that, the younger, is that the older one would actually serve the younger one, which was the total opposite in that culture. And then these guys were born. And it says that the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. Like this guy was hairy. Can you imagine the back hair that this guy had? But this was, this was him. And so they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. And so he was named Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. And the boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. And Isaac, who had a taste for a wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And that last statement is an important one. And so what we see is we have two brothers, Jacob and Esau, and these guys couldn't have been more dif different because Esau was the ultimate outdoorsman. This guy loved hunting and fishing and camping. This guy probably grunted a lot, I could imagine, probably just naturally had a body odor of pine needles. And this guy would go on, Esau would go on these incredible hunting expeditions and bring back all of this meat, which his father absolutely loved. And so I can imagine that they had all of these dinners together, laughed together, told stories together because they had this commonality and that linked them together. But Jacob was a total opposite. He didn't like going outside. This guy didn't even like getting dirty. And so he stayed home and he probably learned some really important skills that were so helpful around the house like he learned to make clothes and he was probably a great cook. And so he had a lot of time spent with his mom. And so what we learn in this passage was that Esau, the older one, he, he was his dad Isaac's favorite. And the younger one, Jacob, he was his mom Rebecca's favorite. And as we're gonna see later on in this story, what ended up happening was, was that this favoritism not only tore these brothers apart, but it tore this family apart because this is what favoritism does. Favoritism fractures families. And as parents, we all have a partiality, we all have, we all experience a partiality towards one child or another at one time or another. And you know this and I know this as well. And favoritism doesn't just happen within the parent-child relationship. It happens in so many other relationships as well. Whether it's the teacher-student relationship, the coach-player, even bosses and employees, they have their favorites as well. And so even if you don't have children, the principles that we're going to be talking about can be imported into these other relationships. 
But the thing with favoritism, why it's so dangerous, is that favoritism divides. And in the context of a family, what favoritism so often does is that it leads to conflict and tension, not only between siblings, but between the child and the parent as well. And oftentimes when we think about favoritism in the context of children, we oftentimes focus on the less favored child. But favoritism can have a hugely negative impact on the favored one as well. Because the favored child, what studies have shown, is that they feel a huge pressure to maintain their favored status in the family. But in addition to that, they have to deal with the inevitable blowback and the hostility that ultimately comes from their siblings. And the thing is, is that these dynamics... These family dynamics, they don't just disappear and then just poof, go away when people become adults. But they so often persist and many times they even get worse. And maybe for some of us here, that growing up, we were the favored child, maybe we're the favored student, the favored player, maybe even right now we're the favored employee. Or maybe for others of us, our experience is that we were the less favored one. But whatever position we occupied, we all have experienced the feelings that can arise as well as the destruction that can happen in our relationships and in our life because of favoritism. And this is why in the New Testament, James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, says these very, very important words. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not, and these are two important words, show favoritism. And notice he doesn't say we shouldn't feel favoritism because he understood that's impossible. But rather he tells us don't show it because he understood the negative impact it can happen on the people around us. And in preparation for this message, I actually read a great book and it's called Siblings Without Rivalry. And you're gonna see it in a moment. And my wife, who's a marriage and family therapist, she meets a lot of and she actually journeys with a lot of siblings and she helps them navigate the tension and the conflict. And when she found out that I was actually teaching on this, she said, you have to read this book. And so if you wanna know more about what we're talking about today and dive a little bit deeper, that is a great book, really easy to read, a lot of great stories and very applicable to that sibling in that family context. And one of the stories that is shared in this book is of a woman And she was reflecting back on her childhood, and she said that growing up, she described her hair as being very frail and thin. Whereas her sister, she had this gorgeous gold mane that would basically come down to her waist. And she said that her dad would always compliment her sister on her hair, even called her Rapunzel. And so she resented her sister so much that one night while she was sleeping, she took a pair of scissors and just cut off huge chunks of her hair. And decades later, as she was reflecting on this, she said, my dad seemed to love everything about my sister, but nothing about me. We're talking about decades later. And as she's sharing this story, her eyes began to fill with tears. And she said, I can't believe it still hurts. And this is the impact of favoritism. It doesn't just simply go away when we actually become adults, but it persists and it can even become worse. And this is the thing with favoritism. If we want to stop showing favoritism, as James talks about in that verse, the very first thing that we have to do is that we have to be aware that we feel it. We have to be honest and courageous enough with ourselves to admit the truth to ourselves. But because when we recognize our bias, it immediately puts us in a better position to protect because that's what we're doing, to protect our children, our students, our players, whoever it may be for us. But at the same time, it's not just becoming aware and recognizing. What we also have to do, especially for that less favored child, student, whoever it may be, is that then going to God and saying, Lord, would you help me to see them in a different way? Would you help me to see them through your eyes? And then taking this beauty and reflecting it back to them. Because what favoritism does is that favoritism fractures families. And so what we see is that with Jacob and Esau, Jacob was his mom's, Rebecca's favorite. Esau is his dad, Isaac's favorite. And I can imagine that this favoritism, it came out in the form of comparison. And we see snippets of it in the story. And I can imagine that some of the conversations that they had was that Isaac looking at his son, Jacob, who just liked to be at home and sort of almost was like this mama's boy. I can imagine him saying to his son, hey, how about tomorrow you go out with your brother Esau? And you go hunting and camping and you go fishing because it's important for a man to have these skills. 
And I can imagine Rebecca, the mom, saying to her son Esau, can you take a couple more showers? Right? Can you clean up after yourself? Why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your brother, Jacob? And the thing is, is that comparison in families is so common. We don't even give it a second thought. And oftentimes how parents will use this, how parents will use comparison is to try to motivate their children. And I know I'm guilty of it because my two kids that you saw in this video, Eliana, who's nine, and Isaiah, who's eight, in my effort to try to motivate my daughter to keep her room just a little bit cleaner, I've said to my son in front of her, I love how you keep your room so clean. And trust me, it wasn't about complimenting him, but it was about motivating her. And even though I didn't use the words, why can't you be more like your brother? Trust me, that, those, that's the message that she received. Because this is what comparison does. Comparison inevitably, it breeds, it leads to competition. Comparison leads to competition. And children who continually receive this message of why can't you be more like your brother or your sister? Why can't you be more like him or her? If they continue to receive this message growing up, what they will do is that they will continue to measure themselves against the people around them, not just as kids, but even into adulthood. Because our children, our, our opinion as parents is so incredibly important to them because before they form their own inner voice, they hear ours. And if ours continues to say, why can't you be more like him or her? Why can't you be as intelligent as them? Why can't you be as organized as them, as conscientious as them, as athletic as them? This is the self-talk that they'll grow up with. And what we see with this relationship with Jacob and Esau is that it comes to this crisis point. And that favoritism and comparison and competition ends up in this terrible event happening. And what happened was, is that years later, is that Isaac was about to die. And he understood that his days were numbered. And so he said to his oldest son, Esau, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out and I want you to go hunting and you know what I like and you know the meat that I like. So I want you to go and get that meat and bring it home and prepare it and then I will bless you. And in the in ancient Near East, the blessing of a father, especially to his oldest son, was so important because it not only was a source of encouragement, but it also provided details concerning his future as well as his inheritance. And it was special. The one to the oldest son was so incredibly special. And so Esau goes out. But what then Jacob does with the help of his mom, because remember, he was her favorite, he goes in and he steals his brother's blessing, which was this. The blessing was this. So may God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. He's basically saying the youngest child would be head over the whole family which was the total opposite. And may those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. And so then Esau comes in and then Esau realizes that his brother had stolen what was his. And so he asks his dad, do you have nothing? You got like nothing to give me? Like you're all out? And his dad says to him, you know what, son? There are no take backs in this. And so he says, this is all I got for you. And he tells him, this is the blessing that he gives Esau. Your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke off your neck. That's the blessing. And it's like, wah, wah, right? When you look at Esau compared to Jacob, and this is what Esau, this was his response. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I am going to kill my brother Jacob. This is what happens. This guy hates his brother so much. Years of favoritism, comparison, and competition ultimately culminate in his feelings of total hatred towards his brother. And that he says, I am going to end his life. But ultimately what we see in the rest of the story is something extraordinary happening, something that none of us would ever probably expect, probably none of the people in this story. But before we actually get to that, what we also wanted to do was we also wanted to receive our general offering and how this is different than the offering that we took 
initially for the India um, to everything that is happening in India with our global partners is that what this offering does is that it helps with the general mission of Kensington and our initiatives, not just locally, but nationally as well as globally as well. And so if you would like to give, there are a number of ways that you can do so and it's gonna come up on the side screens. And the first is by texting the word Kensington to 77977. You can also give via the app or the website. You can also send a check into our physical location here at the Troy campus. Or for those of us in the room, we also have buckets at every entrance and exit that you can place your offering into as well. And so thank you for your generosity. And so going back to the story, what we see is that there's this huge animosity now between Jacob and Esau. And Jacob doesn't just stick around and say, hey, you know what? Maybe it'll get better. Maybe it'll all blow over. But he understood that his brother was deadly serious. And so he runs away and he stays away, not just for months, not just for years, but rather for decades. And during this time, he gets married, he has 12 children, and he also becomes a very wealthy man. But one day, this is what God said to him. Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. And those are very, very important words. Because basically God says to him, I want you to go home. But in going home, he understood that he would have to see his brother Esau again, who he hadn't seen for 20 years. And he had no idea what to expect, whether this guy still wanted to kill him or whether he was over it or somewhere in between. Which is why God says to him, you don't have to be afraid. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And so what Jacob does is that he packs everything up and he starts heading home. And while he was still a long ways off, he sends sort of a messenger, not sort of, but he sends a messenger on ahead to meet his brother. And this messenger comes back and says to Jacob, we went to your brother Esau and now he's coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. What would you have thought if you were Jacob? Right? Your brother is coming at you with a small army. And so immediately, Jacob thinks, this guy is coming back to finish the job. This guy still wants to kill me. And so he freaks out. And what he does is, that, remember, he's a rich guy. And so he has a lot of livestock, a lot of servants, a lot of family. He splits them up into two groups, understanding that if Esau attacks him, at least the first group, they'll probably suffer, but the second group will be able to escape. And what he also does is that he sends this huge gift on ahead to his brother, hoping that it'll appease him a little bit. And so Jacob, he's expecting the absolute worst. But what happens is something beautiful. Because when they meet, it says, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. And he threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Because this is what happened. And we don't know this because it doesn't say it in the scriptures. But at some point, and we don't know when, that Esau experienced this heart change where his rage subsided and he was able to extend this forgiveness to his brother in just a beautiful way. Because in a moment where he could have crushed and destroyed him and gotten him back for what he did to him 20 years earlier, instead, he chose to move towards him and he chose to extend his, extend his hand of forgiveness. And as I mentioned, growing up for me, I was just so jealous of my sister and I really resented her. And she went away, when she turned 18, she went away to college. And after that, we hardly ever talked. And we really, and she was away for her, her bachelor's degree, her master's degree, as well as her PhD degree. And so we didn't see each other. We hardly ever talked. We lived in different parts of the world. And we both got married. We both had children. But we both felt that, like there was a space between us. We both knew that there's something there, something unresolved. And so one day, we actually met up. And I forget whether she was visiting or whether I was visiting her. But we met up and we had a very honest conversation. And we asked each other a very simple question. And the question was, what was your experience growing up? That was it. And then we just sat back and we listened to each other. And I expected her to tell me, you know what? It was amazing. I expected her to say, my, my childhood was amazing. Right? Because I did, um, I did so well, got straight A's all the time. Everyone loved me. That is what I expected her to say. But she said something very different, a very different story. She told me that it was so lonely. It was so hard. It was so challenging for her growing up. Because my dad, our dad, passed away when I was four and my sister was five. And after that, my mom worked like crazy to support our family. And so a lot of the weight, a lot of the responsibility fell on her. 
And a lot of that weight and a lot of that responsibility was taking care of me. And honestly, for the first time, I saw that one of the ways that she loved and one of the ways that she cared for me was that she shielded me from so much and she bore so much of the weight and the responsibility of our family so I wouldn't have to. But at the same time, she also told me something very interesting and that she looked at me and she said, I thought you were the golden child. (laughs) And I was like, are you kidding me? Right? Like, I thought you're the golden child because I'm not not anything like you. But the reason why she said this is because in my family, I am the oldest grandson on my mom's side. And in traditional Korean culture, boys are favored, especially the oldest one, and that is me. And growing up, my my grandparents, they treated me very, very differently than they treated my sister in what they gave me and how they spoke to me. And this crushed her in a lot of different ways. And I could see her hurt and I could see her pain. And both of us going in, we had no idea how this conversation would go. And frankly, I was a little bit afraid. But the thing is, is that we both left this conversation with greater love and greater empathy towards each other and having moved towards each other. And the thing with a sibling relationship is like so many different relationships, it has the ability to bring us so much pain. But at the same time, when I look at the sibling relationship, there is something special. There is a gravitational pull towards each other that no matter, even after long histories of pain and and competition, the urge to reconcile and to try to discover the love and strength that we can only give to each other, it still exists. And in the past few weeks, I've been reading story after story of siblings who, after, who have been estranged for years, some even decades, and they had just the urge to come back together. I've heard stories of people, some people in our community who had totally broken relationships with their siblings, people who have been wounded so deeply by their siblings, but ultimately they have sought reconciliation. And A common thread through so many of these stories is that one sibling reached out to the other, texted, called, whatever it was. And over a phone conversation, some in person, they asked each other a very simple question, which was, what was your experience like? What was your experience like growing up? What was your experience like with our parents? What was your experience at school? What was your experience like with him or her? And then just sitting back and listening. And what so many of these people shared was, was that I heard stories and I had my eyes open to experiences that I never even thought happened. Perspectives that I didn't even know about. And their love and their empathy towards their sibling increased exponentially. And one woman who was estranged with her sister for so long, this is what she said when she was listening to her sister answer this question. She said, then something dissolved inside of me. Then I put my arms around her and we held each other and I felt as if a wall had come down between us. How swiftly understanding frees us to forgive. And I love that last line, how swiftly understanding frees us to forgive. And for so many of us, I know that there is pain and anger and resentment in our sibling relationship. And maybe for some of us, we're like Jacob and Esau and we haven't talked to our brother or our sister in years, maybe even decades. Maybe for others of us, we're still connected, but that connection, we just know there's space. There's this underlying tension that we both feel. And what if, instead of just simply maintaining status quo, because it's been like this for months, years, even decades, and just continuing on in this matter, what if we actually tried to move in a different direction? What if this week we actually had the courage and the strength to reach out and to ask this question, what was your experience like? And not judging, but just simply sitting back and listening. Because that's one of the beautiful things that I see about Jacob and Esau. In their own way, they actually began to move towards each other. When God told Esau, or when God told Jacob, I want you to go home, this guy had the guts to go home and to face his brother after 20 years, not knowing what would happen. And Esau, during those 20 years, he did the hard work of letting go of this anger and this hatred towards his brother. And it ultimately brought them together. What would it look like for us to take that step today? or this week, because this is what I know about God, is that when our relationships are broken, he doesn't want us to just continue with the status quo, but he desires for us to move. 
And in this relationship with our sibling, I know with his help, with his strength, that we can experience wholeness and reconciliation and healing as well. So let's, would you join me in prayer? So God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for our siblings, God. But at the same time, that relationship is so hard. It is filled with joy, but at the same time, it's filled with huge struggles and challenges as well. And so today, God, this week, Lord, for those of us that when we think of that brother or that sister, Lord, we know there's brokenness there. Give us the courage, give us the opportunity, God, to reach out and to be able to have that conversation, Lord. Understanding, God, that when we do, Lord, my guess, my hope is, is that understanding is, is that we will be able to move towards each other in a greater way. And so we thank you, Lord, and we pray these things in your son's name. the world but it couldn't feel me man's empty praise treasures of faith
man. Great, great way to end this service. Hey, can we give everybody who got baptized another huge hand? Congratulations, everyone. Awesome. Hey, we want to invite you back next week for as we're wrapping up this series. And next week, we're going to be talking about mothers and really celebrating our mothers because it's Mother's Day. It's a great, great day. And also, I want to remind all of us that if anybody would like to some, have someone pray with them or for them, our prayer team is out in the lobby. But thank you so much for being here and joining us via stream. Have a great rest of your weekend, everyone. <laughs>